I'm Laura London, and this is the third edition of Speaking of Jung's spinoff show, Speaking with Laura. Joining us today from his home in Washington is author, military historian, and former pro race car driver, John W. Warner IV. He is the son of the late five-term United States Senator from Virginia, John Warner III, and Catherine Conover Mellon, daughter of Paul and Mary Mellon, who, in 1945, established the Bollingen Foundation to translate and publish the work of C.G. Young. John is a graduate of the University of Virginia and is an avid researcher of revisionist alternative history, both ancient and recent. Growing up in a military family that had a seat at many of the most historically significant tables, military, corporate, and intelligence, led to his insatiable quest to find and reveal the hidden truths behind world events. He is the author of the historical fiction novel, Little Anton, published in three parts, and its sequel, Lion, Tiger, Bear. John began writing this series during a two-year recovery from a racing car accident. His extensive research resulted in his, an historical narrative that reveals hidden truths about technological advancements, top secret nonlinear physics, and the many prominent leaders active in the World War II era. Profits from the books go to wounded veteran charities. Hi, John. Howdy. We are, this is take two, because uh, we had a technical issue, which I don't usually have. So I don't know if that was me, you, I don't know what was going on there, but here we are, and we're going to start all over again. And um, where were we? Um, we're talking where? about your your interest in history. Yes. Um, and how you became a military historian. Well, I went to a religious school up uh, at the National Cathedral, and mm -hmm. uh, I was a very poor student. I was a very open-minded, rebellious kid. Mm. And I saw them using religion as a weapon, as threatening me. And I thought, this is a scam. Number one, I was 10 years old. So I forgot. You know, I left religion in the dust. I thought it was completely boring. And so I wasn't very good at doing my homework and wasn't good at getting grades. But I was always in the library reading books that had nothing to do with my homework. And the teachers would always catch me. And, and um, I wanted to learn everything that they weren't teaching us. Um, in fact, the history book they had, it had Vietnam at the end. This is in the 70s. That's how old I am. And, and he said, we're not going to cover Vietnam. And I said, well, it's 1974. You know, it just ended. Why not? And they're like, no, we're just not going to do it. And so I started to realize that they were only teaching us very thin amount of history. And so I would read books on, you know, the 30 years war or the Roman empire or the Vikings or everything, you know, military history, World War II, you know, civil war, and um, all the technology and balloons and, you know, the invention of the submarine and all that stuff fascinated me. And of course, in those days, my father was secretary of the Navy. So I traveled the world with him. My parents had divorced. And so he had very little time at home. So he did a smart thing. He's like, I can't spend time with you that much at home, but you can come with me. So he actually mm -hmm. yanked me out of school. I'd go to Subic Bay in the Philippines or you know somewhere with him in Europe or whatever with my books, you know, school books. I still didn't do my homework, but um, that but was what a great education. Oh yeah, I, I the Navy and the Marines, you know, I, mm -hmm. I love them. You know, I'm a big, I love the United States military. Um, there's some janky factions in there and the Black Projects, but really the 95 percent of them are great and they they do a lot of hard work and um so i got a love for that i've been on ships and subs and oh man i mean for a kid it was just uh, really great and i was interested in all that stuff i wanted yeah. to figure out how the world worked you know i was one of those kids who took everything apart and i was like how does this work i couldn't get it back together but i figured <laughs> it out yeah and i became a gearhead and, and a racing driver mm -hmm. and stuff that so i'm a nuts and bolts guy but um i came to the alternative history um subject really by accident i think a lot of historians who you know i was always thinking out of the box my mother was a hippie type and she's like oh don't trust the government vietnam was wrong and you know i'm not sure about the moon landing and i'm like what 
so she would give me books to read in the 70s when I was growing up, whether it be on UFOs or you know Atlantis or Manly P. Hall or something. She would explain things to me. I'd be like, wow, this is interesting. And of course, she gave me Chariots of the Gods when I was mm. 10. And uh, there's a picture on my website with half a towel and long hair. And I was hiding the book because my counselor in my cabin was a, he was a nice guy, but he was a born again Christian. And he had already ripped a copy of Chariots of Gods apart. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was reading it wow. behind a tree up near yeah. the river near the latrine or whatever. And I'd be like, I didn't quite understand it, all of it at age 10, but over mm -hmm. the years I read it and I'd be like, wait a minute. And I bring it up in school and they were like, go to the principal's office, you troublemaker. You know, wow. one teacher called me a godless libertine. I think he was right. John. So you referenced, or you mentioned your mother and she is the daughter of Paul and Mary Mellon, who knew Jung, who they actually analyzed with Jung. I've been reading all about the history in this fantastic book that was written about the foundation that they created. Uh, the book is titled Bowling In. Um, it's all about Bollingen. the bowling in. Yeah. Bollingen. You guys say Bollingen? Okay. Bollingen. It, and it. I don't know. But that's yeah. what I think it's called Bollingen. Bollingen, An Adventure in Collecting the Past. It was written by William McGuire, and I will have a link to it in the description. And it talks about uh, Paul and Mary Mellon's relationship with Jung, how they met Jung in 1937 in New York City. And then they, um, they went to Switzerland and they analyzed with him. And then, so th these are your grandparents. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into all that, but, um, your mother, I have a photo, I actually put it on Twitter, on Instagram, of your mother with her parents in Ascona, Switzerland, uh, where they would go for the Aranos conferences. And so you're oh, yeah, saying were... your mom was a hippie. Uh, she was, you know, yeah, hippie type in the 70s. You know. And gave you books like that. Oh, yeah. She would explain, she would explain to me philosophy and theology, mm. you know, as best I could as a teenager. And, you know, what Young was about and what my grandfather was doing in the OSS and things like that. But So later how did that I go over with your dad, though? Was your dad was cool fine. with... He was fine he with was that. Fine. Okay. Yeah, he was a, he was a conservative Republican. And he was yeah. Secretary of the and, but, I mean, he loved my mother dearly, um, but they just didn't get along. Okay. Um, you know, it just happens. But they became very good friends after the divorce, um, like a lot of people do. Um, you're much, you know, the pressure's off. So right. the interesting thing, I was, uh, my mother told me a story the other night is when they went to visit Young, and mm. she was three or four, they would stay with Young at his house in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were in the kitchen. <laughs> Carl Young's cutting meat for dinner. You know, he's a good cook, apparently. And um, my mother took one of the big knives and started to help him, and she cut her thumb really bad. And there was oh, blood all over the thing. Oh, and, my, and my grandmother, Mary, came in and she freaked out. And Carl said, why are you freaking out? You know, this is how we learn in life mm. is through, you know, the hard mistakes. You don't learn from folks. You can learn something from it. But we learn a lot of the stuff the hard way in life. Yeah. And most philosophers will tell you, you know, it's like I love this Native American uh, story. The young warrior goes to the elderly shaman or chieftain and says man the path to manhood is just too hard there's too many obstacles and and the guy says the obstacles are the path mm -hmm. and so i think young was kind of reiterating that with my grandmother mary and she could be uh, mary mellon was uh, suffering from terrible asthma it right. was brought on by stress and mm -hmm. uh, she was very uh, twitchy that way but I'll tell you, the family story is that my grandfather was a very bookish guy at Yale. And when he met Mary um, through some friends, they mm -hmm. got to know each other and, and fell in love because of not only their love of uh, philosophy, theosophy, and mysticism, but also, you know, have you read Young? And then she's like, yeah, of course, I love Young. And so that was a component uh, of why they got together in the first oh. place. 
because they were mystics. Mm. And, um, my great grandfather, Andrew Mellon, uh, my grandfather used to tell me, you know, he was a very stern, sort of robber baron <laughs> kind of guy. Uh, I can tell you a lot of stories about him, but um, he's like, you're too bookish and, and, you know, you need to go out there and toughen yourself. Sounds like my dad. You, know, you need to toughen yourself up. Mm. And of course, you know, Paul did in World War II after Andrew died. But it was their intellectual, my grandfather and grandmother, their intellectual love of you know, all things Manly P. Hall, you know, Atlantis, Rudolf Steiner, Young, all that stuff. Where are they thinking out of the box? So... Your great grandfather was Andrew Mellon, who what was the banker and the 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 Pittsburgh billionaire, right? Who and he was in Secretary, Alcoa, Secretary of the Treasury under Harding okay. and who, and then he okay. was ambassador to the Court of St James in 1931. So he got to know the British royal family very well, and my grandfather was very good friends with the Queen and and the British royal family, they would come and stay at his house in Upperville, Virginia. Mm. I remember some, I remember, you know, coming over and, oh, the queen's here. Oh, cool. <laughs> I met her a bunch of times in England and America. And it was interesting. Um, so it's a very small chummy world, you know, in that, in those days in the world war two era, just before and mm. after during, um, and um, but my side of the Mellon family got very close with the British royal family, and then there's some bloodline occult things in there, but that's that's a story for another day. And for another day, okay. So Andrew Mellon had two children: Paul, your grandfather, yeah, yeah and Elsa. Elsa. So Andrew Mellon was, and I'm sure people can find out a lot about him. Uh, he's in the history books. Yeah, he was a very stern conservative gentleman right yeah he's, and then he's, yeah. and then Robert. paul his son was more he didn't want to go into the family business no and he, they but they both loved art and they both collected art yeah the family you know my mother's an artist all three of my siblings and i are artists i'm a writer too so creative gene and so that that love of art and, and the philanthropy and everything uh, comes down to my generation. Um, and How did your great grandfather? He was okay with your grandfather Paul not wanting to be in the family business and creating his own destiny. Um, hard to say. I, I think there was some consternation in that, uh, but you know he knew he knew that you know. Paul was going to go his own way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, banking's not for everybody. It's pretty boring. Right. Um, but let's yeah, talk about Paul. Money, but, huh? I was going to say, let's talk about Paul, because we were talking about your interest in military history, and your grandfather, Paul, was, he joined the cavalry, right? It's a Which, confusing story, but okay. I, I can remember he, uh, he was a U.S. Army major at Fort Riley, Kansas, and he was a cavalry officer. He enlisted and, on his own. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he, you know, he was a horseman. He was a magnificent fox hunter and a horseman. He was master of the hounds many times hmm. in Virginia and, and things like that. So um, that was his interest. But World War II, um, the OSS cr was created by uh, uh, General Donovan, Wild Bill. Now, my grandfather fox hunted with General Marshall, General Patton, and Wild Bill Donovan in Middleburg, Virginia. So they all knew each other. You know, D.C. was a very, D.C., Virginia area, very small community of chummy mm -hmm. people. That's sort of the high end of things. And uh, so he knew those guys. And so when Donovan uh, was tasked by FDR, who was a Freemason, he was an odd fellow, but same thing. Okay. Um, so FDR was a mystic. Uh, so was General Marshall. A lot of the top brass in the American military were the Freemasons or they were in other secret societies. And what those societies hold is basically the Holy Grail cup of knowledge, Egyptian mystery school, mm. Gnostic, Templar, Cathar information about what the world was really like and what our place in the universe really is mm. to, the, you know, to the degree that they knew it at the time. And so 
they were up against the Nazi SS. Now, Himmler was a mystic bar none. Him and Hess, Hess grew up in Alexandria, e Egypt with mystics. And so okay. Haushofer was in that mix. And so was Hitler. Everyone says, oh, he's not a myth. Bullshit. Hitler was too. And so the SS was its own economic, you know, corporate fiefdom. And um, they were using a lot of metaphysics, nonlinear physics for the hunt of atomic weapons and free energy and chemical lasers and transistors and, and all kinds of very high technologies. Mm. And so FDR was like, oh, shit. Um, he knew we, we were going to go to war in the late 30s. It was just on the horizon. You know, Churchill said, this guy's not going to stop till he, he has the whole world in his hands. Mm -hmm. And so they knew they were up against, um, yes, uh, psychologically maybe unstable people. Hitler was certainly a psychopath. Himmler was a high-functioning sociopath, but mm, bordering on, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but he was bordering on that. So we needed an intelligence service that wasn't, necessarily linked to the army or the navy at the time there was no air force in 1939 mm -hmm. so in 1940 uh, donovan cobbles up the oss so who is he going to fill the ranks with he needs well-traveled people with multiple languages mm -hmm. he needs people that understand carl Jung, manly p hall rudolf steiner and, and you name it he needs people with some military experience or he would train them and he needed wealthy you know, people that were posh and could blend in and who knew people in Europe because mm. they had traveled extensively. Mm -hmm. And so Julia Child, you know, the, uh, yeah. Carl Jung got, you know, and there's, the family story is Jung uh, joined the OSS via my grandfather and Mary. They said, okay. we need help. Uh, Alan Dulles was in the mix. Alan Dulles was a good friend of my grandfather's. He was station chief in Switzerland. Yeah. So... My grandfather and Mary's uh, relationship and good friendship with Young came in real handy because, you know, Dulles became, you can read the book, The, Dulles, uh, the Devil's Chessboard about Alan Dulles. He's a real, okay. talk about a psychopath. He became a psychopath. In fact. Mm. But in, during the war, these were desperate times. You know, the Nazis were way, way ahead on their nuclear program, much more than we are told in the history books. I can guarantee right. you that. Right. And they were like, Holy cats, you know, these guys are going to put a, a some type of device on top of a V3 rocket or yeah. a bigger one. And we're in big trouble. You can melt down New York, D.C., and London. Uh, we'd be in real trouble. Morale would tank. Um, that wouldn't end the war to melt down a city, but combat troops' morale was, was paramount because they already were up against the German supermen and the Russians were taking the brutal brunt of it on the Eastern Front. So Donovan had to create an OSS that was very effective, very smart, very fast. And so that's why my grandfather was tapped on the shoulder. I mean, I think my grandfather told me Patton called him one day and said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm here in Fort Riley, Kansas, training cavalry people. He says, that's bullshit. You know, the tanks are the new cavalry. We're not going to use mm. cavalry. And um, he said, join the OSS. We need people like you bookish, smart, uh, well-traveled, um, you name it. And who understood, remember, Pat was a mystic. Oh, yeah. So was that public it's knowledge great. that Paul Mellon was a member of the OSS, or was that all kept quiet? That's kept quiet. Okay. Um, it's, it's obvious now to most historians what they were into, because we mu know much more about what the German SS was into. They... Himmler resurrected the Asatru, Norse uh, pagan religion, and modified it for the SS. And so, mm. you know, Jung said, Jung did the analysis of Hitler, and he's like, he's the Wotan, or Odin, of his people. And it's like, that's kind of true. But, um, you know, Himmler was, resurrected it for the SS because they needed something that was more uh, on the mark, than Christianity or atheism or anything else, it, it, it fit the bill. And that's a long story, but you can look up Asatru, it's still practiced today. It doesn't mean it's evil or anything, it's just they right. modified right. it. It's like the swastika, you know, that yeah. meant good fortune and good luck, and they reversed it. And, and what they thought it meant was, well, it's the spiraling, the swastika is in an angle for the Nazis. 
And what it means is the spiraling, twisting, torsional torsion. Everything is torsion in the universe, yeah. spinning galaxies, planets, everything spins. The Nazis weren't stupid. The SS, they weren't stupid. Yeah. They were, they were mean <laughs> psychopaths, but they weren't stupid. And so they meant it inevitable victory. That's what the meaning of the swastika was to them. And it had multiple meanings, like any anything in symbology has multiple meanings. Right. But you can go to Voolsberg Castle and there's all kinds of a I've been there. there. Yeah. So have I. So it it's it's very creepy and, and stuff. Yes. So boy, did they need people like my grandfather, and they desperately right. needed young. And my granddad told me they were in Switzerland with Alan Dulles and they, they went to Young and they said, Look, we really need you. This war could go off the rails big time. Mm -hmm. It's gonna become an, an, an atomic war. And Young was very afraid of that, he said. And, uh, you know, and, and they, they were, remember, Alan Dulles, by 1943, they were hiring Nazis, not German Wehrmacht so much, but okay. Nazis and SS guys who could see the writing on the wall that, you know, Hitler was on a cocktail of, of heavy drugs by Dr. Morell. You know, Dr. Morell is <laughs> a hero because he doped Hitler up with belladonna and heroin and, and Pervitin methamphetamine, the Germans invented it. So they gave it to all the troops and everybody. They thought it was a miracle drug. Eh, it wasn't. You know, methamphetamine addiction that goes south. It's great up until a certain point. And then phew. so they knew Hitler was losing it. Probably had okay. Parkinson's disease, his hand was shaking. Mm. And so they were like, look, we need your help because you know, these Nazis are bad guys, but you know, business is business. And in the world, you know. The Russians and the Allies uh, were guilty of crimes against humanity, too. Sure. The Nazis, the Nazis were, were the worst, but they in, industrialized the genocide. Mm. But, you know, throughout history, people have been genocided. I'm not making up for the Nazis. I can't stand them, but I know a lot about them. Yeah. So Young must have, to join an American intelligence service, Young must have felt strongly, in my opinion, that yeah, we've all got to clasp hands and defeat these guys mm. because they really could take over the world. And boy, will it be a, a world in the darkness after that. So he helped the cause. And that's not very well known. Um, I have this four eight book. eight. Yeah. What's that? Young was agent 488. His, his, this book by Deidre Bear, who just recently passed away, she uh, wrote, I think she won a Pulitzer Prize for her biography of Samuel Beckett, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this book was published in 2003. It's called Jung, A Biography. It is over 800 pages, and there's a lot about Paul and Mary Mellon in this book. I use it as historical reference because of when it was published, I was told that the Jung family was very unhappy with what was in the book. Um it does mention uh Jung's OSS involvement, and I was never quite sure whether or not to believe that, but you knew them. Those were your grandparents. So you yeah, it was common knowledge. I mean, amongst us, I mean, you know, everyone's like, ah, oh, young is pro Nazi. And it's like, no, I don't think so. Um, Would that, that's a big controversy as well. I know when, yeah, before yeah. Hitler became, tell, tell us what, you know, well, um, the family story is that, that that Young obviously was in Switzerland. You know, nobody attacks Switzerland because it's the world's banker. So okay. you know, Kaiser Wilhelm and you know Audubon Bismarck and Hitler, they're not gonna attack Switzerland. Not gonna, they're not gonna get because all the money is there. And all the Nazi loot is in tunnels and, and things mm. like that. It's still there. It's under uh something called the Octagon Group. Um, but they knew this. Um Dulles was a very impartial guy. He was like, let's hire them. They're the best. And they were the physicists, scientists, the engineers, mm -hmm. the best um, at the time. And they were far more advanced than the Allies. And they were they couldn't figure out why. Now that's very nebulous, but you know, the German technical schools and they have a culture of of engineering and other things. Eh, they were getting some help. But they needed young because this occult side that I've dug out over the decades, uh, books by, you know, Peter Lavenda and JP Farrell and some others yeah. who have dug out things like 
uh, General SS Hans Kammler. And he was probably the most important uh, man in Germany somewhere around March, April 1945, even above Hitler, because he was the contractor engineer who did all the tunnels for the rockets and jets and the other Wunderwaffe wonder weapons. And Hans Kammler came up with the idea of said, wait a minute, you're genociding all these people. Let's let's use them as a slave labor pool and we'll mm. hire them out to the German corporations. So Mercedes and Krupp and IG Farben and everyone was paying the SS money for the slave labor. And so wow. they were, it was, you know, talk about the British, British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. These are the SS was a separate. It had its own Air Force funding streams, banking system, yeah. separate from the Reichsbank and, and Germany and the Wehrmacht. That's why Hans Kammler and Himmler could pick up the phone, get anything done. They wanted they had mm -hmm. ultimate power. Hitler said, yes, as his ultimate power. So Young knew this. He had he had been watching the Nazis rise to power. He knew a lot about the SS. And I, I bet in during the war, he was one of the few experts who knew and said, look, these guys may seem crazy on paper, but I'm telling you, there's something to this occult side. They understand the, the mysticism. They understand Manly P. Hall and Steiner and boy, do they, you know, and all that. And they're into nonlinear alchemical physics that was sort of destroyed in the 19th century in the rest of the world because we went to materialism. Yeah. Not the Prussians. Uh, and the Prussians mm. and Germany and everything. And it's a long story, but basically they knew they were onto something because nuclear research and free energy research, like few cold fusion or zero point, that's alchemical. And in a zero point plasma accelerator, which I think the military does have, it's liquid uh, red mercury, which is alchemy, because you're adding isotopes to that. And you need a chemical laser and other things. Now, how the ancients did that, well, we're not sure, but they did. Um, mm. In ancient India, the Vedic texts describe nuclear war pretty yeah. clearly. So they needed Young and because he understood some of this. And I think it's been played down because this is my opinion, but... Um, once you join the OSS and the OSS becomes the CIA, once Intel, always Intel. My grandfather was always, I mean, presidents and directors of central intelligence, other people. I mean, my father and even my mother remembers Ike coming over to his farm and having secret meetings with Paul Mellon. Mm. Why not Camp David? Right. And so it's, and Dulles was there all the time. Dulles, I think I met him when I was a kid. I remember him. I love Dulles Airport. Yeah. But uh, he died in 67. But, um, you know, he and his brother had a lot of power. Now, Andrew Mellon, I know this is a little confusing. But Andrew mm -hmm. Mellon, the way in the 30s, we didn't know we were going to fight Nazi Germany. Probably okay. FDR knew and probably Patton and others knew we were eventually going to. But the rest of the, you know. They were like, let's finance Nazi Germany. And maybe they're Republicans. And so Sullivan and Cromwell was a very corrupt Wall Street law firm owned by the Dulles brothers. And so Andrew Mellon was financing Hitler through Hamar Schacht. You know, Hitler's whoa, 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 stop. Andrew Mellon was financing Hitler early on. Yeah, Rockefellers, Morgans, DuPonts, you name it. The Committee of 300 American ruling financial families. Okay. You know, you name it. Cabot's, you know, Eisenhower's, Kennedy's. We're all in this 300 uh, thing. It's a little bit of a conspiracy theory, uh, but it does make sense because I've, I've known a lot of these people. And it was no big deal. A lot of corporations, remember Ford and Chrysler and, and GM were building trucks and cars in Germany under license. Yeah. When we bombed the factories during the war, yeah. The contract said we have to, after the war we have to rebuild those GM and had to rebuild their own factories in Germany. I mean it's crazy the the financial stuff, you know, but yeah, through how much shocked it's 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 known Andrew Mellon and you know everybody the Rockefellers and Chase Bank and Bank of New York, they were all financing Hitler, why not? He was 
an economic miracle, which he wasn't. But they thought he, he was turning Germany around. That was a good investment. Okay. It wasn't illegal or anything. During the war, it was illegal, but Standard Oil found a way through Portugal to sell oil to the Germans. Not even wow. The Rockefellers. <laughs> but um, the melons are wrapped up in Standard Oil, Gulf Oil, Alcoa okay. Aluminum, a lot yeah. of military steel, coal, a lot of military stuff. So uh, commodities. I know it's confusing, but um, it really is. Yeah. So it's all a tangled web. Going back to your grandfather, Paul Mellon, who was in Switzerland and knew Jung and analyzed with Jung, as did his wife, Mary, who had health issues. And I had read that she had asthma since she was a child. And she thought that maybe her asthma was psychosomatic. And that's yeah, why she was. Days, yeah. Yeah, why she was seeking alternative uh, alternative therapies to, yeah. to to try to manage her asthma, which, sorry to say, she tragically died from when she was in her 40s. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's tragic. Um, it's just like today's holistic medicine. It's been suppressed and it's hard to find a holistic doctor or a Chinese or Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Medicine is very hard because you know, big pharma, big medical. Yeah. Ching, you know, that's big money. But they didn't have a lot of stuff to treat that back in the 40s. So it was smart of her to try to see if there was a psychosomatic component. Uh, sadly, I don't think there was. I think it was all physical. Yeah. Uh, she was very twitchy, uh, Mary, from the letters um, that she wrote with Young. And they were, they were very close friends from the, I have a letter you know, between, uh, I have letters from Mary, letters, from Paul and, and Young were very close friends. And of course, they, like I said, they stayed in his house in Switzerland before and after the war. Before and, and after Paul the war, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Paul would visit him with my mother and, and my, my uncle Tim when they were kids. They would go to Switzerland. That was mm -hmm. on their sort of European trips. They would always see Carl Young. So he's a family friend. Um, yeah. And they were instrumental, uh, your grandparents, Paul and Mary Mellon, in establishing the Bollingen Foundation, which I, I had mentioned to you I'm very grateful for because Mary insisted that she wanted Jung's writings to be translated into English because at the time he was writing in German, uh, some, some of it was in English, and she wanted it translated into English and published, and she did that. And um, the Bowling and Foundation was around for, I think, about 20 years. And then it was, uh, they the, the funding stopped. But they didn't, the Bowling and Foundation uh, didn't just publish the works of Jung. They also published uh, Richard Wilhelm's I Ching, Book of Changes, and Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, and other books about art and archaeology. And uh, then it was eventually taken up by Princeton University Press, who still to this day publishes the bowling in series uh, from from what I know, so they they did a really good thing there. Yeah. So uh, another thing you you wanted to mention, um, and I would like to hear is now the other side of your family. Your father was married for a time, so a few years after your mother died. No, sorry, uh, your your parents divorced. A few years later. He married the actress, American actress Elizabeth Taylor. And you have some stories about your time with her. So would you share them with us? Well, the story is it was my first instance of Carl Jung's synchronicity. Okay. Now it's February, it's March 1972. Uh, I'm 10 years old. I just had my 10th birthday. Mm. Now, Admiral. Zumwalt was living in our house. My dad was divorced. Um, so we're the three of us. Three boys, <laughs> was living we were living there, okay. And when I say my dad and Admiral Zumwalt and me, we had no idea who Liz Taylor was. We weren't a Hollywood, you know, we were watching okay. war films, Hogan's Heroes, you know, every night. <laughs> right. But I walked into Admiral Zumwalt's. The, the drill was at 0600, we'd wake up and 0630 was breakfast. And so mm -hmm. I was knocking on his door and he's like, come on in, in the guest room. And there was Life magazine mm. with the Taylor on it. And he's like, 
look at that. Isn't that a good looking? He didn't know who she was either. You know, Liz Taylor at 40. Liz Taylor at 40. I sent you that picture. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can bring it up on the screen. Yeah. And so he said, look at her eyes. Isn't that amazing? And my dad came in, you know, and we were thumbing through it, reading something else or whatever. And my dad came in and said, all right, everybody, come on, breakfast, for God's sake, we're going to get in the limo. And they dropped me off at school and they would go to the Pentagon. Or they mm -hmm. would take me to the Pentagon. Sometimes I'd do my homework in his office. So I grew up in the Pentagon. But that's very strange because four years later, the biggest movie star in the world is living in the house. Now, if that's not an act of synchronicity, I don't wow. know. That is so bizarre. It's not living like we knew house. she was. We were, right. you know, my dad looked at it and, all oh, right, it's a good looking woman. So what? Come on. You know, we're all in a hurry. Dad was always in a hurry. Come on, uh -huh. God damn it. You know, and I had forgotten all about it. And then years ago, my wife and I were talking about synchronicity because it happens to us all the time now. Yep. It's, it's almost boring. Yep. Um, and I'm like, holy cats. I think I remember my first instance, and it was a big one. Because dad met Liz at, at, at a, the English uh, embassy party for Queen Elizabeth II. You know, more synchronicity. And it was a blind date. So, yeah, that's it. That's it. And so I remembered this. And I was like, oh, my gosh. We had all three of us have been looking at this magazine <laughs> In 1972, <laughs> having no idea who she is, you know, we don't care. Right. We're a bunch of guys. You know, I'm 10 years old. I didn't know who she was. And wow. then four years later, she's living in the house. That's very strange. So what now? I think oh. I heard you mention, because I said when we were first recording earlier, when it wasn't really recording, um, that I've listened to probably every interview you've ever done. You mentioned something about, did she have a sighting, an experience? Oh, yeah. She, would you share yeah. that with us? Um, yeah. In the 70s, we would talk about, you know, UFOs because I would always look at my dad's top secret briefings when I was a Ooh, kid. Oh, I was wondering. And it said, <laughs> uh, did. Um, a UFO problem or issue. And then they would, you know, talk about Antarctica and Operation Deep Freeze, which my dad was involved in. Oh my and gosh. my dad was involved with the Underwater National Reconnaissance Office. And they had a ship that was built by Howard Hughes called the Glomar Explorer. Now, officially, it was a crane ship. And so officially, it was to go down there to capture a sunken, you know, wrecked Soviet submarine. Well, lo and behold, they were picking up other things off the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. Because the United States Navy, navies in general, always have the highest technology. You know, if you mm -hmm. go back to the Civil War, you've got the Monitor versus the CSS Virginia. Those were very high tech for the time. So navies, have, you know, when they started picking up uh, crash UFOs and other things, they were like, well, let's give it to the Navy because they're they're used to understanding this. Everyone thinks the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So dad told me, yeah, there's some strange things <laughs> breaking up over the ocean floor. And so I was talking to Elizabeth one day when I was 18. And my friend and I, you know, we're all having drinks and everything. And uh, she's like, oh, yeah, I was, I think she said Eddie Fisher and her, they were off the coast of California and they were, you know, sunset. And everyone was having a cocktail party and they saw these lights coming around mm -hmm. and they were like, what is that? and then all of a sudden one of them broke formation and it did a zigzag and whoop, straight up at, you know, Star Wars light speed. And they all started to laugh. You know, it was a bunch of Hollywood people and they all, and they said, uh, seen a real UFO because no way a fighter jet's going to do that. And so she had seen one and she was very open-minded and uh, mm. I think she did read some of Carl Jung. She was very interested in the world. She and my dad uh -huh. had the, well, they loved people and they loved knowledge and other things. My dad was very conservative, but Elizabeth wasn't, she was an ultra liberal. So, um, you know, my dad, that's interesting. Yeah. Liberal. No, that, that it's interesting that your father, who um, I had told you that, so a couple things that uh, listeners don't know that John and I have in common. I used to live in Virginia, Northern Virginia, where John has a farm. And um, I lived there uh, at, the at the same time that you were living there. Well, you've always lived there, right? Yeah. And my I'm parents voted. Yeah, my parents voted for your father. 
who was our senator (laughs) at the time. This was in the 70s. So, uh, and then my brother is involved in the race. Liz Taylor was your co senator. Ah, there you go. So they were together for a a period of time, right? And then they were married for five years and then they were best friends for the rest of their life. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, they would talk to each other at least once a month, which drove my other stepmother later on uh, crazy. Oh, no. but, uh, yeah, but um, they were very good friends. And every time she came to D.C., she would she would hang out at the house and we'd see her um, and stuff like that. So she was she was great. I mean, she was really a, a wonderful person. Um, yeah, movie stars live in a bubble sometimes and they're prima donnas. It's true. But she was a good one. She was a good egg. She dad was a good was not a yeah, yeah. Dad was a very moral, ethical guy. A lot of secrecy. You know, he believed in national security stuff, but uh, he was a very moral, ethical guy. And he he really he said, whatever you do in life, make sure you have that concrete and rebar uh, moral center. Because in my my best friend Tommy, his father was the bishop of Washington, and we went to school all through school together and. You know, we were wild boys you know, through college and everything like that. But we sure. had that moral center, and that came from our fathers. Mm. It's like, I know you guys are wild. I know you you know, you got arrested doing this, that, and the other. But, you know, always tell the truth. Always be. And, we, and that served us well. So, and she she really believed in all that. I mean, she was, uh, she pushed him on, you know, you're an old fuddy-duddy. You know, the universe is this wild place with, you know, infinite amount of people and, Dad wasn't religious, but he would always pull the God card out. You know, God wouldn't, no way. You know, she's like, "You're not into religion. <laughs> said, You're not fooling me, Senator. <laughs> yeah, it's all hot air. You know, oh, you guys. You know, he knew we couldn't. He couldn't fool either Liz or me. Mm. Well, um, that's and interesting. That all kinds of bullshit. She'd call him up. You know. Yeah. You know, better get out of Vietnam. You know. All right. Oh. Yeah, she was right. And my father finally said, you know, your mother was right. The, the oh. Vietnam, double Tonkin was a false flag. Mm. In the 80s, he finally, you know, dad had a, a, a real struggle with the secrecy and the lies that he was and other senators and military people were told from above. And I mean above the president, you know, the intel world, the black project world. And I think he, in the end of his life, he became very disillusioned, and he said, you, know, "You should go forward and talk about this, because it's 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 destroying the secrecy is destroying our nation." And um, he said, "You and your mom, you know, you were all right, you know, about a lot of this stuff." And so that's where he was at the end of his life. You know, he was he was up there. He understood his national security oath. He took it very seriously. But I'd ask him questions, and he would either say nothing or or nod. So he's not breaking his security. Right. Are we back in hearing UFOs for military weapons? You know, mm. And the mm. Majestic 12 files, which are very controversial, and he, I showed them to him in 1993, and he said he, he didn't agree at first, but after a few months of arguing, he finally broke down. He said, all right, now you know, you, but don't go down that road because, boy, they'll, they'll put the kibosh on you. And of course, I said, "Well, I'm sorry. This is, as a historian, and I want to, you know, this is this is wrong." And, uh, but anyway. Well, I I want to make sure. Yeah, I want to make sure that I get this in for the listeners. Um, that on John's website, uh, he has a website. It is John Warner IV. John Warner the Fourth. John Warner IV Author dot com, and I will provide a link to it in the in the description here. You have some podcast episodes that you recorded uh, for about a year, 2019 to 2020. And episode two is with your father. Yeah. And I can hear the reverence in your voice. And I encourage everybody to listen to that. And do you remember what you said to him at the end? No. You thanked him for his service. Yeah. Yeah. He served in, in really Korea, touched by that. Korea, yeah. mm-hmm. and he was Secretary of Navy during Vietnam. So he he did a lot of military service, and, um, and then he 
he involved me with that. I mean, I, I, I literally grew up in his office in the Pentagon because he didn't want to leave me out. Mm. And I think, you know, if you want to get back into the metaphysics, you know, your soul contract, I think in his soul contract was, you know, don't neglect your son. Mm. Uh, something to that effect. Um, my soul contract, I, I think I checked every box. I want to do everything, you know, um, and it makes sense from a metaphysical point of view. Um, I wonder if, if Jung understood that because I, his, his concept of synchronicity, that's the same as a lot of uh, people talk about, you know, star nations and star people. And they say, oh, no, all points of space and time are connected. And hence mm. my Liz Taylor uh, magazine, Synchronicity. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. other instances of, you know, my wife and I have had dozens of them. And mm -hmm. they're just truly, they may, I think it's one of the things, you know, because I came to alternative research very slowly. Oh, okay. yeah. I started off, you know, reading UFO books and, and doing some, but I was very skeptical and, you know, nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. But there was a tipping point when I showed those documents to my father. And he said, yeah, MJ-12 is a real group. It was started after World War II under Truman. Um, uh, you know, Secretary of Defense, Forrestal was part of it. Um, it is my personal belief that my grandfather was very close to it by Alan Dulles, who Alan Dulles became a majestic member, supposedly in the late 50s. Okay. Under Ike, which is a problem. That's why Ike lost control. And he made that speech about the military industrial complex getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. He was referring to Dulles and the CIA and everybody like that doing those black programs. So it's it's my belief that they brought in Young. Remember, the once Intel, always Intel. You know, I I think Young was called in by the CIA, and um, you know, I think he probably truly believed they were doing good work because they they can compartmentalize you very easily, like they did my father and my grandfather to a degree, but there's a quote from Jung. Yeah. And it says, if we, you know, if pro probably so M MJ 12 group brought him in and said, what is your assessment of this UFO ET visitation situation we have? And this is probably 1952 or somewhere around there. And there's a quote from him saying, boy, if we let this out to the public without proper, you know, channels and things like that it's we will be in the in the position of uh very primitive civilizations when it, when more advanced civilizations uh visited you know like tahiti or something and the rudder will be removed from our grasp mm. do you know that quote no yeah i have it um i'll send it to you um i it think sounds that, like him yeah I think they were all very concerned about what was going on. The Germans were involved in it too. Uh, ET visitation is as old as the hills. Uh, if you look throughout our history, the megalithic buildings, the giant stones, and Bale Beck, and you know uh, all this stuff, and then yeah, the technology curve starting in 1900 goes like that. Yep. And the Germans Why? led it. Well, it, it, it's debatable. Um, a lot of what do you said, think? Oh, oh, I think that there's been, you know, angels and demons. I mean, this ET involvement in our history mm. goes back to before the human race even existed. And so mm. I, I believe that it's, they, they, you know, from positive to negative, light and dark and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a duality universe. Humans struggle with our duality. I have a bloodthirsty yes. side. You know, I'm trying to balance my energies as best I can. Yeah. And uh, I think Young understood that more than anybody. Oh, yeah. You know, the peaks and valleys of your right brain and left brain, you know, Hitler was way off, you know. And, but but the people trying to strive for the balance point, which everything in the universe, that's what this means. Namaste. Mm. You know, this is the balance of energies. Mm. Yeah. And you're way off here, you know, doing the Nazi stuff or you're way here doing, you know, new age crystal naive. Right. You know, everyone's love and light and everything. Eh, you want to be in the middle, the balance yeah. point. The universe craves balance. And so, yeah, come on. We're, we're, 
we're star beings too. We're flying around a little blue marble at a billion miles an hour in a vast cosmos in, in our universe. And there's infinite other universes. Come on. I mean, it's obvious. Everyone thinks it's just like, oh, us and them. Because the movies in Hollywood. Yeah. CIA, that's Project mm. Marking from the CIA. And they're always saying E.T. is a threat. Eh, that's one or two percent true. All right, you know, okay. Throughout the universe. But it's mostly bullshit. And and they've gotten us conditioned psychologically to think, yes. oh my God, fear. And they're kind of doing that now with this UAP you know, initiative with my cousin Chris Millon and everybody. Yeah, it's not, they're not to, to, just so the listeners know because there might be some listeners who don't know christopher mellon uh has been out there uh i first learned of him on a television show on the history channel i believe it was the history channel maybe it was a and e uh called unidentified and i saw well anything about a ufo i'm interested in uh, uh was interested uh, it's been so dumbed down now but um I noticed the graphics on this television show. I, I haven't mentioned this to you before. That show, Unidentified, Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, I think somebody else was on there, about these UFO sightings and the Navy gun camera footage. Anyway, the graphics on this television show are the same almost exact graphics of the bowling in series volumes of Jung's collected works, 20 volumes black with a white rectangle with uh, the, the lettering in there. And then the volume number in a uh, baby blue, a certain serif font. And when I noticed this, this was what, three years ago, four years ago. I don't even remember what year that came out. I created a speaking of Jung logo that looks like that because I love that. I love black and white. So anyway, I had reached out to Chris Mellon about it and he didn't respond because I knew the Mellons and the Bowling and Foundation. And this is before I knew about you. And that, so I followed what he was saying and I thought something's off here. The yeah. whole Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon story to the U.S. public about, or to, to anybody, not just the U.S., about what's going on here with these sightings by the military personnel. That's the best you got? Yeah. That, that Tic Tac footage? That doesn't yeah. look like a UFO to me. I'm sorry. Well, what do you it's, think? It's one of ours. The Tic Tac, the Thank word you. is, is Lockheed Martin. Yeah. But let me, let me, for your listeners, Chris Mellon is the former deputy undersecretary of defense for intelligence under Bush and Clinton. And uh, he and I, have known your each cousin. Other. my third cousin. Yeah. We're, third we're cousin. Each, yeah. I knew his brother and Chris and I went to camp together when we were boys and I met with him a few times and, you know, he's a nice guy, we, nice family. You know, we're all family. I don't dislike the guy. I, I just fundamentally oppose his, uh, his uh, program. And what it is, um, it's, I'll try to simplify it okay. as best okay. I can, because it's very complicated. Yeah. Um, the United States government and military, and it's the military industrial corporate intelligence complex. You have to remember all these military corporations, the military and the intel and everything, they all liaise with Congress through people like my dad and Chris. They work together in Congress. Um, what I what we think, and I, I'm quoting from a lot of different researchers that, that I agree with, um, they tried, uh, since World War II, they were very afraid of worldwide panic, the collapse of religions, which is... Yeah. Religious folks may... It's, it, we don't want people to freak out and commit suicide. Um. But also it's about the corporations and money and banking. And if you let out technologies like free energy, like cold fusion, which they're going to do now, um, you can collapse oil economies. You can collapse whole economies with this UFO ET visitation subject because the technologies they've back engineered, your laptop, your smartphone, Teflon, microchips, uh, you know, 
fiber optics, there's a whole gamut, graphene, nanobots, mm. nice. Um, the, these are being incorporated, you know, via Elon Musk and other corporations uh, into the public, but they're charging us money. This is where we come in. It's like, I'm, I'm against this because they're charging us money for these products that the American taxpayer has paid for 10 times over. Mm. But something changed in 2017. Instead of a, a Project Blue Book, which is hot air and run around, and this program, the UAP Task Force and everything, Arrow and everything, that's run around hot air too, with a little tiny scrap of truth. Um, all of a sudden, after 75, 80 years, they came out on CNN and everybody said, we don't know what this is, which I think is a lie. They knew the Tic Tac was Lockheed Martin. The, mm. the, the military always tests new technologies on another branch with only the admirals or somebody who know, and then the crew and everybody yeah. doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. That's as old as the hills, folks. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what's this aircraft? You know, it's black and a triangle. You know, it, yes, they're testing. And so, but something happened probably in 2016. I don't know. I don't think it had much to do with Trump. It might have had something to do with Trump, but somebody in that world, that military industrial intelligence complex, corporate world said enough is enough we got to start getting the public up to speed very slowly mm -hmm. because this, this is not working first of all it's the worst bunch of secrets ever in the history of secrets mm. everything's always been out there it's just so few people believe it because mm. it's out of their normal realm of reality yeah everyone has a hard floor of reality um, i don't but it, it, it and they don't like you coming with an axe and start chopping at that wood. They're like, what are yeah. you doing? And so how do you bring a public up to speed when something that's that's not even in most people's reality? You know, alien, you know, ET visitation, back engineering of technologies, not that, you know, it's hard, but it's not that hard. You know, and, and anyone's like, oh, any gravity, they would have told us. And it's, no, they wouldn't. You know, because people want to make money and there's a lot of greedy people and fascist neocon people in the world it's a fact you know, it's just our world you know there's genocide war constant war and so but they're doing something now and boy somebody really must be pushing them from the inside because they the big people at the top never wanted this out ever mm. status quo to continue now i'm a patriot i believe in the military and i, I used to believe more in the u.s government i I think it's we we live in a corrupt constitutional republic that doesn't work very well anymore. Mm -hmm. I think you know the Catherine Austin Fitz, the economist, uh, she says that our GDP is more like twenty five trillion a year, but most of that is siphoned off, and so is money from foundations like the Andrew Mellon Foundation and others, and World Wildlife and all these big foundations. Very mm -hmm. little money to the Africa or the animals or whatever. Sure. And a lot of it's siphoned off. Now that's hard to grasp, um, but it makes more sense when you've done this work constantly over the decades. It's like, I've seen that. My, my father always had me in the room and said, I want you to listen. Mm -hmm. I want you to use your eyes and listen and shut up and you need to grow up. And I'll tell you a story. Um, that I've told in other interviews, but he took me to the Farnborough Air Show in 93 or 91, I can't remember. And afterwards, a bunch of military brass and all of us went to Lord Muckety Muck's house, you know, in England, big, vast estate, huge mansion or whatever. And I can't remember who he was or anything. And I said, why are we here with these people? And the Russians were there and everybody and oh. the British military were there and, and we were all having dinner and I said, why are we at Lord Muck's house? And he said, we can't do deals with the British without their aristocracy and the royal family. This is how it's done. I said, why? Yeah. And he's like, well, you know, it's complicated and everything like that. But over the years, it's like, you know, that's how things get done. Mm. You know, the royals are much more powerful and richer than you can ever imagine. I mean, everyone from the Japanese royal family and the Chinese dragon society and everybody... These royal bloodlines are very powerful. And so, you know, the world is 
not what people think it is. It is mm -hmm. vastly different. Mm -hmm. And we could talk for a thousand hours before you'd even get a tiny grasp of it. It's that complicated. But um, he showed me and he, and he took me to Montana one time, and I, all these billionaires in a big ranch. Mm. Boy, they were talking, you know, drinking red wine, eating elk steaks. And they were like, oh, we got to get rid of black people. And we need to let this country starve. And how do we make this corporation oh. dominant, crush these? And, you know, I'm just sitting at the table. I'm 27 years old. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> and my dad wow. was like, now you understand how the world really works. Yeah. And he didn't agree with all that. But as a conservative Republican senator, you know, he was, he played his part in the status quo. He's always, you know, beholden to the Navy and Marines. He always gave them, got funding for them and everything. He mm -hmm. knew about the black budget, but he didn't know about the, the enormity of it. And so he he showed me how the deep state and the world works on the down low. Mm -hmm. And boy, that was an education. I, I came away with that. That was a horrible experience for me. And he's like, but it was a good one. Remember, we only learn from the hard experiences. Yeah. And I just, you know, when I look back, when I talk to Daniel List or you or anybody on, online, it's like I look back at my life and I'm like, shit, I've been at Buckingham Palace three times. You know, I, I, I've been in these meetings with people. I don't even know their names. It was first name only. Mm. You know they were, I don't I think one of the Koch brothers was there. I can't remember. But these, those types of people. Yeah. Built the Elon Musks of the world. You know, this was back in 89 that meeting. And I've known some of these people, you know, the billionaires and trillionaires, they're all manipulated from above. Everyone's like, cool. Oh, Elon Musk worth, worth a trillion dollars. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care how much money he has. Somebody's up there pulling his strings. Who's up there. Who's above. Wow. Hard to say, but it's probably from what everyone's research this pyramid image of the world. It looked ridiculous to me years ago, mm. 20 years ago. Now it looks a lot less ridiculous to me. The all seeing mm -hmm. eyes at, at the top. Then you have the Royal families of the world. Then the committee of 300 families in America, then the military and the intelligence and everything and the corporations below that. And then everything else below that. And I thought, oh, this can't be, this is some weirdo's idea of the world. And it's like, I showed it to my dad one time. And he says, oh, this is interesting. And I said, what do you think? And he's like, mm -hmm. sort of, kind of, mm. correct? So that all-seeing eye at the top, what is that? Well, above the billionaires and the, you know, you have the Committee of 300 Families. It's it's not all the family members are corrupt or anything. No, they're they're ignorant, and I love them, some of my family members, but they're ignorant and stupid. Sorry. Um, it's the 5% of those families. Yeah. It's the 5% of the, you know, and above them are round tables. I guarantee you it's mostly men because it used to be all patriarchal. I mean, the Freemasons, they're sort of light and dark. They're a mixed bag of nuts. Yeah. And yeah. But there's no women. Right. Patriarchy. That's a whole other subject, but basically, after the great flood of Noah, all all uh, kingdoms, maybe Zeptepi Egypt, was in equality. The balance of the divine fail, male and the divine female were in balance, and then went over to the male mm -hmm. side years ago. In every society, I can figure out, and so these round tables are probably mostly men. Maybe they have a woman now. I don't know, but who are those round tables? answer to or have on their boards. If you ask me, is ET involved? I think ET's always been involved, whether they look just like us or, you know, you probably couldn't tell, you know, I've been told that, you know, ET's walk the hall of the Pentagon in uniform. You'd never know who they were. They look just like us. So are you saying a human ET hybrid or hundred percent ET? Both. Both. If you're a higher dimensional ET, yeah, whether you're positive or regressive or everything in between, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're they're all in the mix because we're living a duality. Um, it stands to reason that you can project a holographic image of yourself as anything you want, because maybe you look a lot different. You know, 
let's just say you're a tiger headed being from Lyra or whatever, you know, that might upset some people. <laughs> so you want to look like, you know, a handsome man or a handsome, tall, blonde woman like yourself, you know, maybe Laura's Niti, you know, it stands to reason. If you look back in history, very curious, you know, you have all the animal headed gods of Egypt, the Eye of Toth, Hermes, Trimagistus, you know, hmm, all these animal headed people. And then you have the Sinocephalus of the Middle Ages, the dog headed men, and they're portrayed as either a soldier or a grain trader. It was like, it's no big deal. You know, I think the ET involvement in humanity, it became a big deal somewhere after the Renaissance, somewhere after that. And they were like, okay. no, let's not be in public anymore with the tiger head or the bird head or, or the you know, whatever you're, you are. Yeah. And let's yeah. look like, let's blend in. And I think they blended in with us and they're trying to, you know, some are greedy and regressive and some are, most of them, you know, these are the angels and demons and cherubs and everything you see on the wall. My favorite is the halo. Mm. Back in medieval art, everyone's like, oh, that's a holy person. Right, right, right. Oh, no. No. No, I had some, some interesting meeting in people with people 15 years ago, and they were like, <laughs> and they laughed at me, and they were like, no. That meant the people who were elite bloodline, doesn't mean you're you know rich or anything, just an elite bloodline, mm -hmm. who still had psychic, psionic, and telekinesis powers. Yeah, yeah. And so you could talk to the dragons or the sinocephalus or whatever. But these were the elite people, the priest caste, the royal caste. Remember all these paintings and images and tapestries, they were for the elites only to view. Now we have them all over the internet, but in their, um. the people weren't allowed in castles. They were allowed in churches sometimes, but they thought they were taught, oh, no, but Saint John, you know, Saint John the Weird, he's a holy man. <laughs> Saint Saint Laura, she's a good person. And the halo, and it, and that's why these crowns, these gold uh -huh. and gem crowns, gems are used in high tech industry. So it's gold. It's yeah. and they're they're conductors mm -hmm. and transformers of energies. Yeah. And so the word is all those crowns and tiaras and other things. They helped the the generations starting. Mm -hmm. What in the dark ages, I suppose, which just meant the dark ages were the age of ignorance. The church mm -hmm. took over in the east, it wasn't dark ages, but um, they didn't want that philosophy coming over. So it's very interesting, all this stuff, when you start to learn the scams of history, and you're like, yeah. Aha, I yeah. knew it, you know. And it's like, yeah, you know, I'm not saying religious people are bad, They're, most of them are good people. I, I know most of my friends, great people, but it's like, boy, have we been scammed through history. And my dad would always say, oh, you're, damn it, you're a cynic. Stop being so cynical. And then later on in life, he was like, uh-oh, <laughs> you were right about mm. something. I mentioned in the introduction your book series, Little Anton. And uh, when I was reading about it, uh, it among many other things in those books, you incorporate the divine feminine yep. and ancient Sumerian history. Yep. So uh, that that was lost. And that's something that Jung talked about, that yep. missing fourth, you know, the father, son, Holy Spirit, and Mary is the missing fourth and not the virginal Mary, but the whole Mary. Uh, the feminine, yeah, all, both sides, yeah, all sides. Yeah it's all, yeah, it's all solism. It's like Christianity. Um, you can trace that back to solar cults in Roman times and, yeah. and Mithraism. <laughs> Mr. Mithra had 12 apostles too. And of course, 12 is a sacred in the universe. Mm -hmm. Three, six, nine, and 12. That's why we have 12 months of the year, you know, 12 everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a sacred number. And so the holy trifecta you see that you see the celtic cross or the templar cross well a lot of the people in metaphysics believe that the the universe cosmos came into creation through sound and vibration and the and the templar cross the celtic cross is a symbol a three-dimensional cymatic symbol of that um sound 
Mm -hmm. That's why in the Bible it says, in the beginning, there was the word and the word was God. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And the word mm -hmm. was sent. Mm -hmm. because, and the divine feminine is, is, is all our friends out there and there are other uh, mystics and other people. The universe has a feminine vibration. Everything beats mm -hmm. in the universe with a frequency and vibration. And mm -hmm. it's a feminine creational. And that's why I have a problem with patriarchal father God religions. Those are disinformation. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The divine feminine and the divine male means equality, balance. Mm -hmm. Go back to Zeptepi Egypt, the king and queen in balance. Mm. And so the divine feminine was lost. And of course, the Church of Rome, and I'm sorry, folks, it's just true. Yeah. The Inquisitions were all about burning witches because they called the women druids witches. Now, the women druids were very powerful amongst the pagan uh, religions and, and, and Celts and, and the other cultures because they, they embodied this creational cosmic force. Mm -hmm. They can create a human being. You know, yeah. men are just dumb. You know, we're just dumb men. And so the divine male is there to give balance to the female. And mm -hmm. so uh, the church was like, oh, no, no, let's get rid of that. And so they had yeah. the inquisitions and they hunted and burned witches. Now, what's our legacy from that? Women are treated as second class citizens in most cultures around the world. Glass ceilings, you know, you name it. Oh, it's just a woman. Why do we always see mostly men as leaders? We still have an average woman president in the United States. Yeah. It's unconscionable because, you know, in my view, the deep state is mostly patriarchal still. That negative male energy. And Young knew that. I mean, look how many women were powerful in the, in the Nazi regime. Zero. Zero. Yeah. Except for a little bit uh, Hitler's mistress. Ava. Ava. So I want to get back to the Tic Tac. I want to get back to UFOs because what I don't understand and I wanted to ask you is you say that they knew, they know it's Lockheed, they know it's our technology, which when I saw it and I've been involved in the UFO community since the 1980s when I lived in Cleveland and started going, attending uh, the Cleveland Ufology Project meetings on a monthly basis. When I saw that gun camera footage of the Tic Tac, I didn't understand what the big deal was. And I'm going to mention it here. I've meant, I mentioned it to Ralph Blumenthal when I had him on the show a couple of years ago, David Fravor and Alex Dietrich were featured in a PBS mini series on about the Nimitz. I'm, I love aircraft carriers. It came out, I think in 2008, a 10 part mini series on PBS called carrier. And they were featured very heavily, very interesting, just a, a real real, an unscripted reality show life aboard the USS Nimitz. Then in 2017, I'm like, I know that guy he's on carrier. And then Alex Dietrich was keeping her identity secret. She appeared on 60 minutes, you know, with in shadow with a, I think a voice changer, like that's the woman, that's the female pilot that it was his wingman on, on carrier. And now these people are the spokespeople for this coming out about UFOs. I thought this, this sums up here. Yeah. This looks like an op. So the Nimitz, the Nimitz footage was all over the internet in 2004. The Tic Tac. Really? Footage. So what, so uh, but you have to remember this, this UAP arrow, which is all domain anomaly research office and the Pentagon, everybody, Chris Mellon, Elizondo, all the, it's a dog and pony show, but it's a marshmallow soft disclosure initiative. And while I disagree with 99% of their operation, I think it's very slow. I think it's very naive and, and misleading. Mm -hmm. I do agree with the 1% of it. And that okay. is, they're dealing with a very, uh, you know, I love people, but it's, they're dealing with a very ignorant public with a very, yeah. very short yeah. attention span. We've been manipulated with, you know, media and everything. The news is, is um, you know, it's the news is corrupt. I'm sorry. Every news agency in the world, actually Al Jazeera and RT News are better, but they, they manipulate the public. They tell us what they want to know. 
Uh, it's not a conspiracy. My father told me that in the 80s. He's like, oh, CNN lies all the time. It's just the way the news is. You got to read between the lines. You better start. And so what they're doing is they, they want to start this ball rolling. But boy, do they want to do it slow. Mm. And I mean very slow. Um, it's so slow, it's boring. Uh, they don't reveal really anything. Um, mm -hmm. They totally ignore the disclosure movement, which I can't blame them because it's probably 50% you know, crazy bullshit and 50% yeah. truth. The trick, mm -hmm. is, trick is how do you discern? You know, it's like the hermetic law of discernment. It takes, it takes decades to see. Historians who, like me and others who see trends over long periods of time, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I've seen this before. You know? okay. and it takes a lot. So I, I try to simplify things for people, but they're doing a very, very slow initiative because they really don't want people to panic and they don't want religious upheaval. It's a real but, issue. But if, if the Tic Tac is not extraterrestrial, if it's it not. is... Okay, then what the hell is being disclosed? Ah, well, what they want to do, probably, I'm just thinking ahead. Okay. Daniel Litz and I and others, J.P. Farrell, you know, we're always trying to figure, what are they thinking? Yeah. And so yeah. what they're going to do probably is over the next 10 years, disclose the technology we have, especially America, which is back engineered UFO technology from okay. out of okay. town. Um, the Tic Tac, the story is, Charles Hall was an Air Force uh, officer in the 60s, and he said he, he was out at uh, Indian Springs, which is near Area 51, Groom Lake facility. And he said, uh, you know, he was read, he given a huge clearance. They do that to enlist in, doing, it doesn't matter if you're a sergeant or a four star general, if you're red in, you're red in. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they need people to work you know, the day to day stuff. Yeah. And they yeah. said, they, okay, we've got some visitors living with us uh, in a facility underground here at Indian Springs, and they were called the Tall Whites. Well, the Tall Whites are very tall people with very, very white skin. You know, they kind of look like us. Uh, Charles Hall writes, they put a hats and suits on, and they brought them into Vegas and had dinner, and nobody noticed. <laughs> I lived in Vegas for six months. And, trust me. <laughs> You walk down the street and your head was this big, you know, probably people wouldn't really notice. So the tall whites are cousins of the Anunnaki. They're supposedly they're oh. blue collar Anunnaki. Now, oh. Anunnaki uh, are from ancient Sumeria. Zechariah Sitchin said it, that it means from the heavens they came. Okay. You know, it's pretty obvious. They were 15 feet tall. They're on the cylinder seals. There's all these... You know, people have decoded the clay tablets, the Sumerian tablets from the Baghdad Museum. People are still stealing them. Um, mm -hmm. And it shows, you know, we had this much grain, um, you know, they plowed the fields and I'm going to trade with these Hittites over here. And, and oh, the god Enki is doing a gold mining operation and, you know, and they're, they've got to send some spacecraft. And that's what the cylinder seals reveal. It's very matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And so the tall whites, the story is from, I've got it from several people. Uh, one guy, I trust some ex-military people I talked to and they're like, oh yeah. And we're, we're, we've got some people that we're sort of hiding because they're hiding from somebody out there. Okay. Not sure if it's the other Anunnaki who are angry with them or something. You know, it's just family squabbles. So mm -hmm. there's a group of them supposedly out in Indian Springs. They're very tall. And what do they use as their, you know, everyday Jeep? A white cylindrical craft with skegs. Mm. Uh, and so the agreement they have with the U.S. military and the Air Force and everybody was, we'll give you asylum, but please share your technology with us. And they were like, okay, but we're going to do it slow. And so it's mm. taken them. Has the Air Force had the Tic Tac anti-gravity craft for how long? Stephen Greer, and I agree with Stephen Greer because it jibes with my other folks, and that is if the U.S. military is showing you something, a technology, they've had it for th at least 30 years. Mm. So they probably had Tic Tacs flying since the 80s, but they're just showing it to the public now. And so but they're going to say, well, this is our technology, it's sort of. I mean, our engineers are very good. We're very creative people, human beings. 
Yes, but we we got the blueprints from somebody else. To me, they're trying to pass this off as UFOs. And there's so many people in the UFO community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they want to keep fear down. And I agree with it. Okay. I agree with Chris Mellon and these people. They want to keep people from panicking and fear. Oh, my God, we're being invaded, whatever. Right. By showing you, look at this really cool technology we have. And then slowly over time, they're like, well, you know, hey, we got the blueprints from the tall whites and all these little gray guys were, you know, yeah, they've abducted some people, you know, but, you know, we didn't have a choice. And President Eisenhower had a Hobson's choice and, you know, and it'll slowly come out, which isn't a bad way to do it. The problem is, I agree with you, we're running out of time. Yeah. The people who wear the really dark black cowboy hats are like, fuck all you people. What's in it for me? I don't care. If you let this out, we're going to we have technology that will blow the earth in half. And then nobody wins because we want all our marbles. And screw all of you. And these are the psychopaths of the world. And unfortunately, they're in that top round table, all seeing eye, you know, mm. boardroom. And that's the problem we have. It's like how to disclose without doing it too fast or too much to either cause public panic, religious upheaval, but also get the ball rolling because there's some sort of internal pressure. Now, I, I surmise this internal pressure is nothing new, probably goes back to the 60s. Some people call it the alliance. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's the lighter gray hats, because there's nothing in our universe that's really white or dark. That's mm -hmm. what the yin and yang symbol mm -hmm. symbolizes. A little bit of light in the dark, a little bit of dark in the light. You know, mm -hmm. Hitler liked kids and dogs. <laughs> that was it. But that was his tiny little bit of light in the dark. Mm -hmm. But when you spin that symbol fast, everything turns gray. So we're dealing with a, a, a universe and world and reality that is pretty gray. So everyone's looking for easy black and white answers and there's none. Yeah. And so I tell people, boy, you got to have a lot of flexibility because our universe and reality is very flexible and perspective is all important, you know, and some of these ET come down and they're like, well, we want to, we want to steal all your llamas and orchids. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I thought you were going to help us with all, well, we will do that. We love you guys. But we want all your llamas and orchids. And I'm like, wait a minute, you, know, you got to leave us some. We love it. You know? And so they have that little bit of dark in the light. Mm. You know, and everyone's got an agenda, whether it's positive or negative or anything in between. And so, yes, the military and the deep state and the black hats and the gray hats and the white hats, they've all been struggling with the fact that, um, you know, out in the universe, everyone has a different perspective and a different polarity a different vibration you know and it's like yes we'll help you but we want all the <laughs> llamas and orchids tough you know and that's so they, they they're starting disclosure in the lightest marshmallow terms lightest touch there's a quote from someone mm -hmm. and i agree with it, and it says the greatest power needs the lightest touch mm. I agree with that philosophy, but what's going on now? They're just sowing more and more confusion. I think it's too slow. Um, I don't think Chris Miller is a, a bad guy. I just think he probably not informed. You know, a lot of these guys compartmentalization is everywhere mm -hmm. in the public and in the, in the government and everything. And so he's probably got this much of the UFO ET file when it's really mm -hmm. feet tall. So, and we're all trying to figure out, you know, what is the truth on this and what isn't. Right. But the law of averages says that if you take everything, all the books, all the Internet stuff, everything, probably 50, maybe even 60 percent of that is on the money. It's just how to discern it. And that's mm. the trick. I'm trying. I'm trying. But yeah, we're all, flawed, you know, and it, it's it's very difficult. I think young um and my grandfather and all those people in the OSS and back in the day were like, oh, holy cow, what are we going to do? We've got to figure this out really fast because if the Russians get ahead of us or, you know, a yeah. lot of Nazis escaped to Argentina and maybe the Antarctic base. 
Mm. And the Operation High Jump was very suspicious when mm. Nimitz and Byrd went down there and with a huge task force to Antarctica, supposedly to test equipment. And it's like, why not do that off Alaska? Mm. Uh, oh, we really need to go to Antarctica with the penguins or walruses. No. Very suspicious stuff going on. Yeah. And so yeah. I think America in the early, late 40s, early 50s, we needed all the help we could get. Young, my grandfather, mystics, maybe even some ETs that were a, more of a positive bent, and maybe some ETs that weren't, because national security and defense was everything. And I think we were manipulated, you know, to being more fearful than we should have been. Because mm. if you're a group of pirates and you see this planet that's in turmoil and there's like, there's opportunity there, because within chaos, there's opportunity. So, you know, where are the pirates? Well, they're near the war zones, you know, the 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 weapons salesmen, the you know, you know, the the black market people, you know, they're always around the periphery edge of war zones and things like that. I tell people they're like, "What are we trading for this technology?" Mm. Well, it's not money and it's, you know, sure gold because it can be used in technology, gold and gems and things. Well, what else? And I said, "Well, if I had to guess, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars give us hints, they, the big hints. They talk about slavery and trade. If you go to a, a, a bazaar, a black market bazaar in the Middle East somewhere out in the desert at a warehouse, and you've got tons of gold and money, what can you buy, Laura? Anything mm. you want. Yeah, I was going to say anything you want. Yeah. Anything. Anything. So now I won't expand on that, but mm. this is a um, human race is evolving and we're, we're starting to grow up. And it's like those of us who study all this history and military history, war history is very interesting. I found out by the, my 20s in college when I was doing Virginia history and the history of the Revolutionary War. Yeah. Uh, the American Revolutionary War, you know who, who really won the war? The British East India Company. Mm. They made money on both sides. Sound familiar today? You know, mm. big corporations with their own armies and navies. Whack and Hut, Blackwater, you know. Uh, corporate, corporate entities win no matter who fighting a war. Mm. It's a famous book, uh, War is a Racket, you know. Albert Huxley, you know, other people have written about it, but most people just don't pay attention. They're just watching the news for 10 minutes and they think, oh, I'm up to date. Right. Oh, remember the, the, the tagline? Everything you need to know about, you know, X. Mm -hmm. Got it All here. the news that's fit to print. Yeah. So uh -huh. my, one of the things that bothers me the most, and I'd like your opinion on this, is... Our fellow Americans who feel, think that they are entitled to the truth. And my thinking is, I am a United States citizen. I am a taxpayer and I vote. I give the government, the military money through my taxes to keep me safe. I don't give a shit what you do, keep us safe. You don't need to tell me what you do, how you do it. Just keep us safe. Why is it that people in the UFO community think that they're entitled to know things? I don't know. I didn't say that right. It, so I'm a, a New England Patriots fan. That would be like me saying, I'm a season ticket holder. I buy, I go to the pro shop and buy all the paraphernalia. I am entitled, Bill Belichick, show me your playbook. I'm not entitled to that. We're not entitled to know how the U.S. military operates and keeps us safe. So all this push for disclosure, and I know Steve Bassett. I had drinks with Steve Bassett. Steve Bassett's a fun guy to hang out with. But his push for hard disclosure and hearings, congressional hearings, I, I just think it's never going to happen. 
why would the government, the military tell, I mean, tell a friend, tell an enemy, right? Why would they tell us things that we don't need to know, need to be kept secret because it's part of strategy. It's part of how they operate. Am I off? Am I wrong? Um, no, I think it's a perspective uh, situation. Um, I, over the decades with my father, I was very much a patriot in national security, defense. I still am. But um, the problem is, Laura, um, I believe, you know, it's like President Eisenhower with Alan Dulles and Area 51. He wasn't concerned with the secrecy. He understood national security better than anyone being five-star general. Mm -hmm. He had a problem with the chain of command, which had been corrupted. Now, Alan Dulles, Majestic 12 group, I don't know what they call themselves today, but they still exist, part of these roundtables. Mm -hmm. They have usurped the American Constitution and chain of command. Hmm. And I have talked to admirals and generals and things about that, and they were like, yeah, we're really concerned, but there's nothing we can do because... There's always so many above them giving them an order. And you have a point. It's like we're not we're not deserving of everything because they need to keep some secrets to, to you know, there are people in the world who want to start wars, but you know, this thing with the balloon fiasco, that's probably some part of this initiative by people. Remember the military industrial intelligence complex is all factions. That's mm. old as old as the hills. The Army and Navy and Air Force, they've always hated each other and jealous. Extrapolate that times a thousand. I mean, there's all these groups and one corporation is jealous of another. But the problem is the corporations and the Majestic 12 group and these roundtables, they took over the roost in probably around 1958 when, and I believe the story, that Ike was going to go send the first army of Colorado out to, to Area 51 and his quote was, I'm going to bust this thing wide open. They're mm. usurping the chain of command. Mm. And they're doing unconstitutional programs. And they're using taxpayer money for it or fraud, you know, bank fraud, other funding streams. Because, you know, the war on drugs, I think, is a joke. Um, the CIA made a movie with Tom Cruise and they were like, ha, ha, ha. No, magnify that times a thousand. I know for a fact I've talked to. Uh, officers from Vietnam, they were like, oh, you don't understand. You know, Vietnam was about many agendas, but, you know, gaining control of the Amer of the Golden Triangle heroin money mm. was one of the big ones because my uncle Stacy Lloyd worked for the American Information Service in Laos. It's the CIA. And he went to his grave with secrets, but he, he, he was a very sick man and he drank a lot. And he, he's like, I... I can't tell you a lot of stuff. And I said, well, I know about the heroin and UFOs were seen over Vietnam and there were missing troops, stories about large numbers of missing troops on both sides. And he would nod and say, oh, there's a lot of that in there. It's it's the CIA and other agencies and, and three letter, four letter, five letter acronyms of you never heard of and never will mm. Mm. that are usurping the constitution and the chain of command. And Stephen Greer said it. He says there's 35 security levels above the president of the United States. So I'm not concerned with what the military itself wants to keep secret. I'm concerned with those groups who have obviously, if you do the work, it's obvious. Um, they've run off the rails 64 years ago. And, and Kennedy's death, I think, was a potent warning to everyone wanting to change that paradigm. He's like, no, you won't. We'll kill a president. We can certainly kill you, general or admiral or whoever, senator. And my dad said that was that was really real. You know, he said most of Congress is ignorant of the unacknowledged uh, special access programs, the black programs, the black funding streams. Mm -hmm. My dad said most of Congress is ignorant. He said only a few of us with really really top clearances, who liaison, like with Chris Mellon and others to these round tables. And he said, you know, he said, uh, that's just the way it works because this secret technology they have, I told you, it can split the earth in half. And we're also 
becoming so it's a breakaway civilization almost i would say that's a thousand years ahead of the public sector you know i don't have a problem with the military keeping secrets either and i don't have a problem with most national security topics i have mm -hmm. a problem with these people that run off the rails and my grandfather paul mellon was part of that and my dad told me so he says oh yeah they, they met at his house you know the british royal family Ike, you know, Nixon, a president. My dad was very close to President Nixon. He was uh, an advanced man and speechwriter in both elections. And that's how he, he obtained being undersecretary of the Navy in 1968. Now, the mm -hmm. word is Nixon was going to release part of the UFO file. And they said, nope. You can do your EPA. You can, you know, the Chinese thing was a no no, too. And they said, well, we're not going to kill you. You're too public. And he had a lot of powerful friends, Nixon did, neocons. And so they were like, just leave, leave office. And he did. Saved his family, saved his own life. I mean, that's these people play hardball. You know? So you don't think that all UFOs and UFO sightings and UFO crashes, you don't think they're all our tech. You think some of it is coming from some somewhere off planet? It has to be because... If you go back, let's just do the 20th century. If you go back to okay. the 1920s, the mm -hmm. civilian pilot and military pilot reports are in the millions. That's the aircraft reports are in the millions. Not to in mention, the the, yeah, the reports. Chris Mellon makes a big deal. He says, oh, the military you know, pilots aren't given a voice. And that's bullshit. That's a lie. Um, it's just they, they've kept it. On the down low, and the, the, the sightings by uh, average people, you know, seeing, you know, aliens interacting with ET and, and everything, they're a humongous number. It can't be just the U.S. military. We don't have that many craft to even attempt to do that. Neither do the Russians or the Chinese or anybody else. The British Five Eye nations, you know, yeah. we have nowhere near that kind of. You know, we have a lot probably, but we don't have near and we have better things to do with our high tech spacecraft than go around abducting people and you know doing sightings over West Virginia and, and whatnot. Well, that's we can, another you know, issue the the abductions. What, what do you think that is? I think it's real, but it's also the Stephen Greer says the military got wind of that and started doing them on their own to confuse the whole issue. So you think it's both? I think it's both. It's both military abductions, the my labs, what Melinda Leslie calls the mill labs or my labs, and then off planet extraterrestrials are abducting human beings. Yes, but it's complicated. Um, what I've figured out, um, first of all, it's been going on since the beginning of planet Earth. I mean, genetics experiments, it's said by many people that genetics are really the top barter goods in our universe mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. if you're a race of people on a planet and it's very desert like and hot and you got two suns and it's like holy cow you know we got to go underground you know our skin's getting weird and we're, we're starting to die well you just go to you trade on the black market not the black market but the black market or the up and up market in the universe and get genetics you can splice in and you become healthier and you can handle the two sun radiation so it makes sense. It, I think the abductions uh, are probably 50% regressive and 50% positive because, you know, Dr. Lloyd Pye proved it. I'm sorry. I mean, we did not evolve from apes. We have a small amount of Neanderthal DNA, which has some chimpanzee DNA in there for strength. But come on, I mean, the diversity in the human race is incredible. I was like, yeah, where did the aborigines sure come from? And they're like, well, and the scientists say, we think it's this. And humanity came out of Ethiopia and Africa. It's like, that's horse shit. You know, the, the human race yeah. came out of nowhere. We are yeah. not. Neanderthals, Australopithecus, you know, Lucy and all those proto-humans, they're not human homo sapiens. Right. They're just not. Yeah. Neanderthals had these huge brains. They had fur and they had huge strength. They were really good about living in the wild. Look yeah. at us now. Yeah. One bug bites us and we're sick. I mean, we're right. meant to have technology. We only survive with bows and arrows and fire and the wheel 
and everything our, and medicine, our technologies is the only way we can live on planet Earth. Yeah. We can't walk through the desert naked. You, know, you and right. I would be burned to death and we'd die in a day. Yeah. Come on. It's not that hard. I think people have a large, <laughs> you know, we've been lied to all our lives, academia and yeah. schools. You know, our grandparents and great grandparents were taught the same bullshit. Yep. And it's like, it's to keep a lot of this stuff in the hands of the few. The, my fundamentals of history. Everyone's like, where's the proof? And I'm like, well, that's a good question. What are the fundamentals of history? We're very creative. We're very loving. We're inventive. Why hasn't the fundamentals of history ever really changed? The elite few mm -hmm. rule the vast many. Never changes. Slavery. All kinds, debt slavery, sex slavery, whatever, human slavery, human trafficking never goes away, ever. Um, wars and weapons development, a constant. History is just war to war to war to war. Mm -hmm. I asked my teachers in high school, I said, why, why is history, you know, a few papal army things and the Renaissance and some art things, and, but it's mostly war, right. war, war, war. Right, war. right. And they said, history is written by the winners. Napoleon said it. A teacher told me that in high school. He said, you know, our history is defined by wars and weapons development, the strong taking over the weak. Well, look at the British Empire history. You know, America has learned from that. I mean, we have military bases, I think 900 around the world. We have an mm. empire of sorts. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Mm. And, you know, my dad was concerned about that. He was really trying to help bring the number down. But anytime you close a military base, Laura, he would tell me that they, boy, they put two up in secret. Mm, and I knew, oh, interesting. Like one shed in the desert and then below ground, a huge complex. And he said, there's, pro there's around 200 deep underground military bases in America alone. And you know, who knows, heaven knows how many around the world. That's why in Afghanistan, I talked to special forces guys I know, and they're like, mm -hmm. oh, shit, you know, they'll, they'll publicly draw down troops and say, oh, look, we left Afghanistan. But our special forces and black ops troops are all up in the hills in those tunnels mm -hmm. that, oh, by the way, weren't built by the Taliban, but they're ancient. They're so ancient, nobody knows who built them. And so we're always there. The, the heroin money, the... the we're right near Tibet and China, you know, and, mm. and Pakistan is a very strategic position. And there's a lot of ancient treasures, probably Anunnaki stuff and other things. I mean, the British have been after this, this search, the Spanish conquistadors. Everyone's looking for ancient maps, you know, gold and jewels, absolutely. But technology, you know, mm. Napoleon invaded Egypt with his Freemasonic scientists and, and mystics. They knew what they were looking for. They mm. probably knew the general area with local help where the Rosetta Stone was. And oh, by the way, I wonder what else they found. Well, maybe 10 Rosetta Stones and other things that they could, you know, it probably took them 200 years to figure out what this gold object does. And then they handed it to some psychic person. They were like, oh, my, my psychic abilities are, are improved tenfold. You just have to use it like this. And it's like, aha. And that's from, you know, ancient Egypt. Who knows how old it is? Maybe it's 10, 20, 30,000 years old. Mm. It starts to make sense. That's what all this tr uh, religious wars in the desert, you know, that gets into bloodline wars and, you know, who's, you know, whose God is better than yours. And, you know, oh, come on. And a lot of it is just, you know, who's got the best stuff. That treasure. This gets into the what is the Holy Grail, which you know, the Templars, the Cathars, the Gnostics, and you know everybody's been looking for. The Nazis right. supposedly found it in Languedoc. And Otto Scorzani and a bunch of SS commandos supposedly found part of it. So what is it? Well, it's a cup of knowledge. It's everything the Freemasons and the mystery schools around the world and the secret societies and you know, the elite and the military and everybody know. And that's the truth of our real history. That mm. we're, you know, Earth is Grand Central Station, Atlantis, Lemuria, ancient high civilizations were legion. You know, going back, you know, 
as far as you want, millions of years. You know, it's not that big a deal once you get over this hump of disbelief. And I'm, you know, like I said, I'm a military historian. I want, I want to see the proof. And it's like, well, all these stories, you know, they, they have a basis in real history. You can look it up, but it takes a lot of effort. Yeah. It takes an amount of viewpoint and imagination to piece it all together. Mm. It's hard to do, but I'm trying to simplify a lot of it in my work. And that's what other authors do. That's what Farrell does. That's what Lavenda and Igor Wachowski and you name it, Bosley. You know, we're trying to simplify some of this information, esoteric, holy mm -hmm. grail of knowledge information, mm -hmm. so that the average person can understand it because it's very confusing and Byzantine and difficult to understand and believe because it's like, what do you mean the Prussians had anti-gravity in 1850? That's bullshit. No, it's bullshit because we've been taught that it's impossible right. or hard or it's like it's not in, in the programs. It's easy peasy. You know, that's the world. I mean, and I think Young realized a lot of this. Mm -hmm. That's why the USS begged him to join. And I think my grandfather was there with Mary Mellon. They said, listen, you've got to do it because the Germans are way ahead of everyone. And if they conquer the world. You know, we're, we'll have worse fact. We are in a kind of a quasi-fascist totalitarian world. I mean, there is no free press. I mean, you go to a peaceful little country and it's nice and everything, but you mess with the rich mm. corporation, or the military, or the police. Adios. They'll bury you in the desert. You never existed. You're a common person. You know, it's just it's a it's a dark thing, but it's the way of the world. My father showed it to me. He's like, you need to grow up mm. between the lines on everything because you're not going to get the truth from the news or, you know, a mainstream history book. you got to do some digging. He always said, you got to do some more digging on that question. So I'm not going to answer it for you. I can't. And what I can tell you is limited. So you need to figure it out. You know, I, I said to him in the eighties, you know, is this, is this stuff real? You know, the UFO stuff. He's, Maybe. So he's not breaking his oath, but he's he's telling mm. me, I know you're smart. You're a wild man. <laughs> you look to party. Go crack a book. Yeah. Your mother, your mother was on to something, and her mother, Mary Mellon, was a mystic, and she understood Paul Mellon. They both understood their 1930s, 1940 era cup of knowledge of the how the world and the universe, mm. our place in the universe, was. Uh, my grandfather always had in his library, he had books by Manly P. Hall and Atlantis. And and I, I remember thumbing through them as a kid. And he's like, are you interested in all that? And I said, yeah. You know, we would have conversations about what he did in the war. And I've said that in my other interviews. I don't know if you want to discuss it here, but you know, he said, well, the Germans had a lot of advanced technology that you wouldn't believe. And this is after three or four of his, his lethal martinis that were 100 proof. Mm. I couldn't drink I even at 25. I couldn't barely slug one of those. Wow. Light it on mm. fire. You could use it as gasoline. Gruesome tolerance there. He must have. Well, he knew he was, he, um, he was very aloof. He was very patriarchal and kind of an anti Samite. His sister mm. married Warburg, Mr. Courier. So Elsa Mellon married a courier and they mysteriously, their plane went down in the Caribbean. <sighs> Right. I read about that. The family story is the CIA had a hand in that. Oh. And I'm not going to go into the details, but my grandfather was always intelligence. Remember, he had all those people visiting him at the farm. He yeah. Had security teams, Laura, in the 70s. They were all ex-FBI guys with machine mm. guns in their cases. They didn't fuck around. You know, it's so wild hearing this from yeah. you because like I mentioned to you, I don't know if this made it on this recording or the one we did before, but last night I watched on YouTube an hour long special documentary on Paul Mellon, your grandfather, and it never mentioned his military background and it painted him as this really sensitive, art loving, horse loving, nature loving Yes, and True. and the National Gallery of Art, yeah, uh, was Remember, built and put and golden wreath on your head. 
Yeah. I love my grandfather. You know, he did good things. He was a great philanthropist. But again, got billions of dollars. Come on. I mean, this guy had legions of security in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were hard-hitting guys. I knew them. They were really nice guys. You know, I knew them. They let me shoot through machine guns. But, you know, it's he was deep into national security issues up until the last days of his life. He was not this... Just, yes, he was all of that. He loved art. Mm -hmm. He loved horses. And he was a master of the It hands. wasn't he all, all of him. He, he had many but sides. They don't, about, they don't tell you about the other stuff. My, you know, Chris Mellon is not the only other Mellon to be in in military intelligence. There's been other Mellons. Okay. Okay. The er, In the early days, in the early 50s, Congress was at war with Korea. We didn't have a lot of money. We were just reeling from World War II. We were, you know, we were a strong economy, but we were still... So the CIA and the NSA and the National Reconnaissance Office in the early days, before they were really public, they were funded privately by the Rockefellers, Mellons, mm. DuPonts, you know, and, uh, and down the line as a patriotic, you know, holy cats, we got the Soviets to deal with. And the Cold War was really bullshit on the down low, but the generals and admirals were fighting it. <laughs> holy shit. General LeMay almost, you know, Burned mm, up the world. Curtis LeMay. Well, thank God for the the Kennedys. I mean, they, John Kennedy was reckless, but he, I believe he was killed because he wanted to cooperate with the Russians on the UFO file because the Russians and we and everybody was thinking, holy shit, you know, these things in the sky, we're, we're shoot, trying to shoot them down and we cannot shoot them down. It's impossible. A real ET craft. And Maybe it's the Russians. And and so they oh. had, my dad said that even in the SALT II talks, which he was involved with mm. in the early 70s as Secretary of Navy, he said, man, we've got to set up teletypes and everything with the Russians. We've got to communicate better. And a lot of this had to do with the UFO uh, traffic in the sky. Because very few really? in the early 70s, we had very few that were ours or Russian or whatever. Very few in the sky. British and everybody, Australians had a couple. But they were, you know, they were, you know, it's always been Grand Central going on in the skies. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want nuclear war to happen over it. Yeah. So that was another concern. And so the early days, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, my grandfather's legacy, it took me decades to drill it out. And mm -hmm. I had to talk to a lot of people. And, um, you know, these, these are people I trust. They're ex-military, they're ex-politicians. And they're like, oh, the melons. <laughs> Holy cow. You guys yeah. are really deep in military intelligence. Mm. We're a small family, the Mellons. There's only about 130 or 150 of us alive at any given year. Hmm. We're not like the other families that are much bigger. And it's like we've had a I've been told I can't I don't know the names. I think Richard Mellon Scaife was in military intelligence or the CIA. Like David and Nelson Rockefeller was deep into that. And David and you know. They want people like this because they have a vested interest in the economy of this country, mm -hmm. you know, and they, yes. care, they care about our national security. Mm -hmm. They don't want us going communist or whatever. I mean, they had real concerns back then, but they also knew about the UFO file and how much corporations were making off the technology of it. God bless America. I mean, my money is tainted with that. I admit it. You know, mm. it, it's not just Gulf oil and Alcoa and aluminum. You yeah. know, through the years, my family was heavily invested in Lockheed Martin and Boeing Defense and, and uh, you know, Grumman and, you know, down the line. I mean, these are mm. good things, solid investments. And, oh, by the way, they're recession-proof. I told that mm. to my I said I had a meeting at the bank in New York. And I said, we should invest in more military corporations. They're like, oh, they don't, they're not that great. And I'm like, they're recession-proof. Mm. Like, point. oh, no, no, no. Lo and behold, most of them are. Good point. Good point. So the crash at Roswell, 1947, what do you think? Was that ours? Was that E.T.? Um, there's vastly too much emphasis on Roswell. Uh, yeah. Remember, yeah. In 1947, that was just another. The problem was it got out in the press, the mm -hmm. local press. But it what was it? it? There was a Cape Girardeau crash in 1941. Yeah, the UFOs have been crashing. But but they're ET UFOs or, or is it experimental 
U.S. technology? No, um, the opinion is split. I, I'm kind of on board with J.P. Farrell when he says I, it was probably a combination of German and maybe some ETs on board because Barney and Betty Hill describe in their testimony, they never tell you this, but Barney Hill describes a German in a, in a uniform right. as well as the gray aliens on board. And so the Germans were probably hopping, hitching rides on UFOs for whatever reason. And they were probably spying over the 509th atomic bomb group mm -hmm. in Mexico. And the word is the Klystron tube for scalar radar was invented by the Varian brothers, Russell and Sigrud, and they're in my new book. Now, scalar okay. radar, that's, you know, very microwave frequency scalar waves. Hmm. Well, the story is that the 509th had the most powerful radar in the world. Mm -hmm. They needed it, airborne intercept radar and ground-based radar. And someone, maybe the German paperclip scientist said, hey, these Germans from wherever, Antarctica or South America, they're going to come spying on you with a disc. You better bring them down. Uh... They're going to, they want us dead for working with you. And they want to ruin any chance of you retaliating with an atomic bomb in Antarctica. Interesting. And they could do it with the B-36. It was a six engine long range bomber by 47. They had a couple flying and they're going to, they're going to blow them up or something to that effect. Right. And so they flipped on this scalar radar and that they, the Germans knew from ET or from somebody that'll bring them down. And it messes with the, you know, uh, your, your garden variety UFO flying saucer disc mm -hmm. as an energy source that is free energy, zero point, mm -hmm. something like that effect. Some of them have a, a system that's a, a two isotopes, you know, the, the quantum singularity, the quantum flux between two isotopes it gets a little complicated. But whatever happened, that scalar radar crashed it. And it wasn't just Roswell. In 1947, there was... Yeah. 30, Polona Peak, Corona in Texas and everything all around Aztec. military bases. They brought them down. Got it. Said, Hot damn, we've got something to retaliate with now. Because mm. remember, in the military and especially the black projects and everything, there's all these factions. We're seeing yeah. it today with this UAP task force. Yeah. I guarantee you, as limited as a disclosure vehicle that is, there's someone in the deep state going, oh, I'd like to kill all these guys and get them to shut up, but they can't. Mm. Because the balance of power has shifted more towards the positive. Because they wouldn't be telling us anything, Laura. This has been the most classified group of secrets in the history. Of, it's a terribly kept secret. But they know the public won't believe it until it's on CNN, the president right. or somebody says it. Right. They're not going to believe me or you or you know. Those guys are tinfoil hats, you know, and who can blame them? Because we've been lied to the, yeah. the, and, the and the the potency of the lies and the cover ups. And, and they, they just ignore. They used to ignore the UFO subject. CNN would, you know, like Tucker Carlson, they'll tell him to use the giggle factor. Yeah. And he had an interview with uh, uh, the new physicist on board the UAP task force. What's his name? Uh, Gary Nolan. Gary Nolan. Yeah. And from Stanford. Neither, neither of them know anything about UFOs. And then they started to giggle and laugh because they, whenever they're told to do that, the conversation becomes silly and everyone's like, ah, I knew it. It's all joke. And there's no ETs. And they're, they're sort of doing this weird back and forth by sort of disclosing things. And then they're like, no, no. Chris Mellon uses the word, oh, I won't rule out aliens. Mm. But remember the definition, words are important. Mm -hmm. The definition of alien is just a foreign entity. An other, so yeah. Referring to anyone, Chinese, Russian, Iranian, mm. you know, Ukrainian, I don't. So he gets an out. He said, well, I said alien and that, and that means, you know. Mm. And so, but he said, but this isn't that. And so if you listen to these people, they're very, very careful with their words because yeah. that's counterintelligence training. And I've studied that. So, you know, Daniel List and Greer and everybody, 
We're like, oh, yeah. They're telling us a little bit of truth surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. Mm. What good is that? Not much. Not much. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our time here today. So I want to thank you, John, for sharing everything with us. I really appreciate you opening up about these topics that um, are important to me. And I hope uh, that the listeners will have uh, had their eyes opened uh, if they keep their ears open. And um, I really do appreciate you sharing uh, it. Did you have any parting words? I will uh, provide links to your website and your books in the description. If there's anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, it's what I tell people. I mentor some people very quietly. Okay. And I said, listen, you know, it doesn't matter what I say or anybody you know says, government, military, it doesn't matter. What's important is everyone thinking for themselves. Yeah. You know, come to your truth with your, trust that gut feeling, your higher self. That sixth sense. That's very real. And when you learn to trust that, things become evident. You can't tell somebody, you need to think this way and you need to know the truth right. from me. That's wrong. I always preface my talks and saying, you know, I don't know anything for sure. I'm not an expert. No one's an expert. But it's like, think for yourself, yep. believe in yourself. Yeah. And yeah. once you trust that intuition, which women have more, divine feminine, you know, mm -hmm. they have more of that. But it's like the truth will reveal itself to you naturally on your own terms. Mm. And reincarnation is real. I believe it. It's like we don't have to learn everything in this life. Every, every life experience is valid. If you want to sit on a porch and drink whiskey and look at the sunsets in Montana, and read the paper and not do much else. That's a valid perspective. You know, I can learn from that, you know, and, and we all learn from each other. And so yeah. it's like, you don't have to be involved in all this, and know everything. I don't, I don't can't understand metaphysics. You know, I struggle with it. it it's like alchemy. It, good luck. You need 10 lives. Yeah, really. Yeah. Alchemy. But I know yeah. enough. JP Pearl drilled it out. The philosopher's stone which is our higher consciousness in the alchemical mix. It's like we are all evolving up the food chain, so to speak, spiritually, our souls, you know, and it, it's all learn. Everything's a learning experience. Everyone's like, oh, my God, I'm afraid to die. And it's like, no, it's just this is just like being at college. It's just an experiment, you know, mm -hmm. and you that's how Mozart wrote a concerto at age five. He had a million lifetimes as a musician, you know, mm -hmm. pattern. And Henry Ford, you know, it's people need to do it on an individual basis and not yep. sure you could, you know, expand. If you want to believe in this, and that, that's great. You know, it's everything is going to come to a pinnacle at some point. It's like, don't sweat it so hard. You know, people are, you know, all concerned. And it's like uh, a decade ago, I, I learned that uh, it's like this stuff will overwhelm you easily really quickly it's like being on a racetrack i mean you you, mm. you know i was going 200 at the, at the high banks of daytona and everything in the at night in the rain i was like how did i get mm. here and i got there 18 years of slow taking it slow and mm. working my way up because you can't buy your way into pro racing if you do you're going to die and i've mm. seen it you have to you have to earn your stripes you have to have some talent and so it's it's like that. That taught me to think deeply, think fast, and trust, you know, control my fear. And that's the, the thing I took away from racing is uh, is all that. Plus, I had missing time when you're racing. You're sort of in an intense meditation. Because your life is in danger every second. Right. So you're in an intense, it's like combat. You know, combat's the most intense. Mm -hmm. But you're in that zone. You're doing one thing and you're unconscious and you're higher self. And I remember I had missing time. And I was like, my crew chief said, where have you been the last two laps on the radio? And I said, I don't know. Oh, I'm on autopilot. And I wasn't the only guy or gal to have that experience on a racetrack. A lot of people in combat do or flying planes or whatever is something yep. you're missing time. Your consciousness is somewhere else. Your immediate consciousness is doing a job. 
that you've trained yourself for, but your higher consciousness is doing something else. Mm -hmm. And so interesting experiences give you interesting perspectives. And I, I've had, I've been blessed to have a lot of those. Some of them were, you know, I told you they're very dark and upsetting to me, but it's like, yeah, I want to know the truth of everything and the truth. Remember it's polarity. It's everything. It's yeah. not just the lighter stuff. Everyone concentrates on, you know, crystals and new age and let's raise our vibration. That's all good, but don't, don't, don't ignore the other half. Yeah. It's, Cause it's it'll hard. Come, it's hard come up from come behind up. you. If you do. Yeah, so, and I always say, do your own research, come to your own conclusions. Mm -hmm. I'll we can help you along if, if that's where you want to go, but don't force yourself to do it. You know, it's like, you know, my sister is very mystical and she understands some of this, but she doesn't want to do the, the heavy duty stuff. And she's just not interested. Mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. You don't need to in, in the next lifetime or the next or the next. It's all going to become clear. But I think we're in the time of the Great Awakening. I, I, I really do believe that. Otherwise, we'd be talking about tulips and purple llamas. Right. Carl Jung was raising those llamas. I don't know how they get a purple. Oh, he had some genetics from them. I love it. Okay, John. Well, thank you again. It was so great speaking with you, finally. And yeah, uh, I really too. appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks so I, much. I, I was watching your channel, you know, Starting a couple years ago, I was like, "Oh, I should learn something about Young." It's in my Were family. you? Thank you. I was. I was like, oh, "Man, I'm really behind the curve." And so I caught up a little bit, but I'll never be a, a Jungian expert. Anything it's not easy. Young is not easy, and the people who think they understand Young don't. If you think you it's understand warm, Young, don't because it's lens, but it's a good that? lens. It's a good lens to view our reality through Carl Jung. He's a genius. It's a great use, a, use as many lenses as you could find. Mm. You know, everyone's Good like, point. I don't want to see the world through Adolf Hitler's lens. It's like, I don't either. Well, I think Jung would our encourage world. us to see through our own lens. Yeah. And that's our not an lens. easy thing to do. No, it's important because your own lens is, is all that's important because it's your lifetime, it's your experience. You know, follow your passions. Yeah. And your own path, yeah, not somebody want. else's path. Yeah. And Young knew that. He was, yeah. You know, I think so. Uh, and he, he understood. And then my last thing I wanted to say is it's my yeah. personal belief that Young not only knew about the Tula Society, which was inside the SS, but okay. perhaps in the Vril Society, which came about in, in uh, Weimar, Germany, or, you know, right after World War I in Vienna. Uh, with some mystics and aristocrats, you know, um, I think there's a lot of validity to that. I don't think Jung was part of the Thutula Society, but I think he understood all the mystical stuff that, and the occult stuff that they were imbuing the SS with. When you say Tula, is it T-H-U-L-A? E. T-U-H-T-T-H-U-L-E. And Tula... Ultima Tula was the mythical uh, Norse land of the north where ah. the wisdom and the gods came from. And you can look it up and everything like that. So they call themselves the Tula Society. And yes, they got rolled into the SS and Hitler, they, they supposedly the Viral Society picked Hitler and everything. But it kind of went off the rails because really their intentions were very peaceful. Maybe some mm. racial things in their Aryanism and everything. But I think it's very misconstrued. But I, I know that I, I think it has to be Young was well aware of what they were up to. And that's why the OSS needed him. What's going on in the Tula and the Vril Society? Because they were involved in the high tech. Remember, the Germans were alchemical physicists. And alchemical okay. was higher consciousness. And so it's all wrapped up together. And I think they needed Young for that kind of expertise. And I don't think he was a member of them, but I, I think he knew what they were doing. And what they believed and they were up to. So, and all the symbology, the symbols that they used, Jung um, was. There's a whole program in itself, symbology. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting. And uh, like I mentioned to, for the listeners, I will provide links to John's books and some of the books that he mentioned. I'll provide links in the description of this video. 
And there are lots of other interviews that John has done uh, that are available on YouTube, uh, like with J Dark Journalist and others. And I will link to those as well. And thank you again, John. Well, thank you, Laura. It was fun. I mean, we really had a yeah. Get the brain working with a little coffee and see yeah. What happens.